Hello everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. We're coming at you live this evening from Hoss Tools headquarters here in Norman Park, Georgia. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And uh, we've got a really awesome show planned for you tonight. We're going to be talking a lot about seeds starting tonight. It's the right time of year. Um, easing in the fall a little bit to get these fall plants started. Uh, we do a lot of transplanting for fall so we can you know reduce the weed pressure a little bit so we're going to go through detail by detail how we like to start seeds We've done a lot of testing over the years and what we've found are the best techniques yeah the summertime here we don't necessarily have seeds starting on our mind right now it's kind of still hot here in the south everything when our spring is over with we're kind of in a little bit of love but now's the time to plant those cold crops for coming on this fall that's right that's right so stuff like uh your kale your broccoli your cauliflower your collards lettuce lettuce kohlrabi yep. uh, any of those cold crops like that a great time to start those now and, um, and get them ready for transplanting end of september early october around yeah the here in the south we can actually grow th several different crops we start them now and we just keep them going all the way through up north you may have to start them now and kind of phase it out on into when you start getting your frost dates in there and it starts getting real cold but you can get a lot of growing done between nine between nine the time the hard winter comes yeah and what's unusual to me is is from a lot of our customer surveys and stuff we do a small percentage of the people that grow a spring garden actually grow a fall garden which is surprising because Fall is one of the more enjoyable times to be out in the garden to me once you get that kind of cool, crisp air. Yeah. You just kind of have to think, change up your thought process and what you're going to grow a little bit. You know, it's harder to grow things like tomatoes and peppers and stuff like that in fall. Although we can do it here in the deep south, but it's a lot harder. But those cold crops that we enjoy along, I mean, we grow a lot of collards here, mustard and things like that. You can enjoy those, they're great to eat, and, and they are conducive to growing in the fall. So, you know, you have to change up to what you're growing, change your strategy a little bit, but you can grow your food pretty much year round if, if you plan right. So you have to start thinking about soups and stuff like that, mm. kind of that uh, hearty stuff you're gonna mm. be growing. I'm telling winter. you, we love us some kale soup. That's one of my favorites right there. Oh yeah, good stuff, good stuff. And uh, we've got, um, we just had so much rain. We haven't been able to get anything. We've got stuff in the greenhouse that's ready to go. And we just haven't been able to get it out. We've got these uh, these zinnias right here. Yep. Which are, I mean, just right, probably could have been planted last week that need to be planted. So we got a couple of trays where it should have been planted yesterday. Right, and so we're waiting on it to dry out down there at the Sunbelt Expo. Uh, but we've got a nice little root ball here nice little transplant there and um once we transplant those in the ground once they grow up a little bit there's a certain technique there on pruning them you do to keep them from getting too leggy but that's that's perfect right there. that's a good looking plug there that's what you're looking for and that's what those seed trays we got to do for you yep all right so kind of in that vein let's talk about our tool of the week which is a very new product we just brought on board this is a product we've been using for a long time in the greenhouse, but it was used to be kind of only available in these huge bales and that you can't ship. You about can't even hardly pick them up. So they've started making this stuff uh, in smaller bags, more available to the, the everyday consumer. And uh, we really like it. Yeah, the Pro Mix is a, is a brand that's been around for a long, long time. It's one of the most respected brands out there and of course they're out of Canada all your good mixes come out of Canada because that's where they have the peat peat bogs the peat bogs and this particular one has the mycorrhiza in it mm -hmm. that's right now what is mycorrhiza so mycorrhiza uh, if you saw my two minute tip uh, mycorrhiza is a symbiotic relationship between plants and fungi so what the fungi do is they kind of increase the absorption network of the plant roots. They allow those plant roots to absorb more uh, things in their environment. Uh, on, in return, those plants provide glucose or food to the fungi. So they uh, help each other out, both benefit from the relationship, and uh, it's something that you want in your soil. You want in short, it's just a beneficial fungi. Right. Okay. All right. And also, this particular one 
is organic and it has an organic fertilizer in it to help get your plant started. We'll go over that a little bit more in depth further along, but this is a great mix right here. Uh, it comes in a container here. What is this? What, how many? I think things? 16 quarts. 16 quarts, which is enough to do two of our trays. Right. So mm -hmm. you can do two of our big trays with this mix right here. Uh, it's a great product. We've done a lot of testing over yeah. a period of time, and this is the one to come out on top for us. So last year when we were starting all our plants for the Sunbelt Expo, we had always used this stuff. We knew it worked well, but we were we wanted to before we brought on and started carrying one, we wanted to test them on. So we had, I think, six or seven different types. Uh, some of them were screened better than others. Some of them were chunky. Some of them were pretty light, like this stuff. And uh, this stuff grew the best transplant by far. Yeah, and if you're really concerned about organics, this is uh, Umre listed there. So it is an organic product. And it's got plenty of that perlite in there, which is, uh, the commercial growers around here, when they start seeds, they actually cover the whole top of the cell with perlite. Yep. Never really understood that, but they all do it. Uh, you know, I've always been taught that you needed constant seed contact for that seed to germinate, but they use that perlite on top of that and keep it wet and they get a lot better germination, quicker germination with that perlite. I think it has something to do with, you want some air to be able to get in there and kind of have some circulation yep. around yep. that. Otherwise, well, you're going to get some disease. You know, the stuff. flip side is they got germination chambers and that kind of stuff that they can force that germination a little bit quicker. I think in a home garden situation, I think the way we do it is probably the best bet. All right. So, yeah, go on online, check out that Pro Mix there. Really good stuff for starting your seeds for fall uh, and spring as well. Um, now, getting into the, the meat of the program today, we want to talk about all things seed starting. So what we want to talk about what we start in the greenhouse or in a seed starting room, what we direct seed, and we want to kind of get, walk through a tutorial of kind of how we do it. Yeah, we don't want this to be overwhelming because it can be, but you can start your own seeds for your home garden at, at your place. You just have to do a little planning. You have to maybe figure up your little a, layer, uh, a way to do it. But it's pretty simple to do, and once you get started growing your own seeds and growing your own plants, then you're going to be hooked. That's right, and at this time of year, you don't even need a greenhouse. Nope. You just need a table or something that's going to, you can water and it's going to drain below it. Yep. Now, in the spring, you might want some temperature-controlled space because mm -hmm. you're going to be starting when it's pretty cold outside. But this time of year, uh, once these trays germinate we've been putting them on a pallet outside the greenhouse mm -hmm. so you don't need a greenhouse no. to grow your own plants right um let's talk about things to transplant things to maybe transplant and things that we definitely don't transplant okay um the things we transplant are a lot of our fall or really early spring crops like we mentioned earlier like our toscano or our lacinato kale mm -hmm. um our broccoli Mm -hmm. or we and we like we grow a variety called green magic which is really heat tolerant um cauliflower mm -hmm. which we have a white heat tolerant variety of that and then the purple we're doing again this year mm -hmm. collards collards you can go either way on collards you can direct seed them or you can grow them by transplants i think if you're planning on doing a one cut probably direct seed them because you're just going to go in there and swipe them but if you're going to repeat harvest them like the top bunch or something like that you probably want some some more regulated space in there and that's the thing about transplants is you can regulate that space some better than you can with direct seed that's right and uh kohlrabi of course kohlrabi is a root crop kind of a root vegetable or sign of kind of sort of right <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it does good transplant yeah um of course lettuce Swiss chard does really good transplant, and yep. then in the spring, obviously, we transplant our peppers, tomatoes, and yeah. eggplant. Nobody should ever try to direct seed tomatoes or peppers. Well, I did have a guy in Arizona one time said they direct seeded peppers out there. Yeah, chili peppers, wow. and that, evidently that's the that's how they grow them out there. But uh, that's very unusual to me because peppers are one of the hardest seeds to get to germinate and come up. They are tough. They usually take at least a couple of weeks mm -hmm. to come up. So, so all of those crops there, kind of my rule of thumb is anything that's going to require a 
foot spacing or further in the garden, we're going to transplant. So all this broccoli, kale, cauliflower, I'm going to put that on one foot spacing mm -hmm. right on top of those drip emitters. Yep, 12 inches. 12 inches. So in that situation, I'm going to transplant those things a foot or wider. Um, now, there's some things that we we direct seed and transplant depending on time of year. Um, one of those being beets. Mm -hmm. I have better success with transplanting than I do direct seeding. Right. But we, we've done both. Um, definitely okra. Yep, and, and one reason on the okra is a common mistake I used to make was trying to plant okra in cool soil. And that's a, a mistake everybody tries to make because we want to get a jump on spring, but I'm telling you, okra seed will not germinate in cool soils. If we plant them in the greenhouse, we can get that temperature up and get a lot better germination than growing them in the ground. Now, if you're direct seeding later in the summer, you when you when your soil warms up, you're gonna have better luck with it. But I have got to the point where I just like to direct seed all my okra. Yeah. I mean, excuse me, transplants all my okra. Yeah. And you can, we put that on one foot space. Yeah, and, and it works out perfect. Um, zinnias and sunflowers, we can go both ways with those. I, I, I've direct seeded them, and we've got these here we transplant as well. Yeah, our seeder works great with the Pro Cut uh, sunflowers. I, I direct seed those. In fact, I, I got some growing now that's maybe a foot high. Sunflowers is a great cover crop too. I found that out this year. So uh, I keep sunflowers growing. They're easy to seed uh, in our cedar, and I'm not a big proponent of, uh, of transplanting those. And then the things that we definitely don't transplant. Now this is not to say other people might try it, but around here we don't transplant. We don't transplant corn, beans. Although we've tried. We've tried. Um, it doesn't really work that way. We had good results one time, and then I had a pretty much a failure this last time, so I'm off the corn transplanting wagon. I'm gonna direct seed it from now on. And the, the reason we did it to start with was we were using it as a backup plan to fill in some skips at our expo garden last year. Um, but yeah, that direct seed to corn, the beans, and the peas. Mm -hmm. I have seen people transplant English peas before. Yeah. But uh, we always just direct seed those. Yep. Now I've seen people transplant squash before, and you do with your pumpkins. I have. Um, I do because it's just a situation where I have to because uh, of certain things. But generally, I would prefer to direct seed them. Right. Because once again, they're go they're you know fairly wide space, and it's just as easy to go and. Squash seed to germinate on concrete. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you yeah. don't have to. Uh, it's it's nothing tricky there. Yeah. Uh, cucumbers, definitely with the greens mixes where we're planting them really intensively. We're direct the micro those. greens. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and finally carrots. Yeah, I've heard seen some people try to do carrots, but uh, uh, and carrots are tough to get to germinate. You got to keep the the seed bed really wet. Um, but we direct seed us those as well. Okay, so now let's let's talk about different uh, vessels for growing your own vessels for growing your own trays or trays or trays. So, um, well, first of all, let's talk about this this thing right here. So you may have seen one of these on some YouTube videos. This is called a soil blocker. It's two different sizes right there. Okay, now I've seen people use this effectively. And this is going to work real good for you if you've got all day. If you ain't got nothing to do on Saturday. That's soil block. Yeah. You got all day and you need to do about 100 plants and you've got a good five hours to do it, then you can go with this right here. Yeah, you got to mix you up a recipe and you got to put water in and you got to get your, your consistency just right so it'll pull up and make these little blocks here. And then you press that down and it makes the indention where you can plant. The soil, therefore, has no support around it, so after you water it a few times, it very well could fall apart. If you want to do this, that's fine, but I can be at the house and have a slaw dog finish what I'm going to do and have a nap by the time you get through. So these are not very efficient. Yeah, and like he said, you got to use a special mixture that's not cheap, uh, a lot more expensive than buying just a sterile good seed starting mix. So uh, if you're just in love with Elliot Coleman or just... 
want to do something kind of slow and archaic, go with this right here. You know, some of the argument there is being sustainable. I think that's a bunch of baloney. Because <laughs> if you use our seed tray and take care of it, it'll last you a lifetime. Right. And there's nothing more sustainable than that. Right. So I, I, I don't fall in that argument. However, I can get into the sustainable argument a little bit if you're using those flimsy throwaway trays. I can understand that sustainable argument somewhat. Right, but if you're using good trades versus this, there's no sustainability. I can promise you there's nobody on a large scale or even a mid-sized scale on a farm using this technique right here and, and, and being efficient with it. And the, another theory out there is that the roots don't wrap around and you get less transplant shock. We actually tested that out and that's, that's a little bit of baloney too. Yeah. Um, so. That right there. So if you disagree with us, that's fine, but that's our thoughts on the soil block, and we're not big fans at all. For the dogs, and we, we're not just saying this, we've tried. We've tried, it. yep. Okay, then your second option you've got is your old flimsy McFlimster here. So these are your cheap trays. You can get them online, different places right here. And you're going to get about one use out of these. Now, if you're growing plants and you're going to give them to your neighbor and you know your neighbor ain't going to bring your tray back and you're never going to see it again and you don't care about filling up the landfill, this is the one to go for. A lot of people go for these right here because they sell them and they're not going to ever get them back and they got to have some form to transplant that plug, sell them at market or, or whatever. And that's the reason these things are as popular as they are. Yeah. Now, you, if you step on these, they run. It's thick. And uh, like I said, one time use, if it's full of plants, you really can't tote it with one hand because it's going to bend and flip on you. You see it, it'll start cracking right there on you. And you can just mm. tear mm. those things apart because they, they're just cheap, not made yeah. out of anything. You just sacrificed that one, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> so the way we like to do it, and let's show them what we use. Well, where's it at? It should be in the oh, bottom okay. of that box right there. All right, so let's see you tear that one in half. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. So, <laughs> this stuff here is thick. You can jump on it, you can stand on it, you can cuss at it, you can do whatever you want to do, and you pretty much ain't going to, I believe you could drive a truck over it. I really do. These things are injected molded, and this is hard plastic, and this is what the commercial guys use, and there's a reason behind that. These babies will last for a long, long time. So you make a one-time investment, take care of it, last you, I guess it lasts you a lifetime. Yeah, you're going to pay more for this than that one I just ripped apart, but you don't ever have to replace this one. Yep. And we we leave these out in the sun. They sit in the greenhouse. They bake, and yep. they don't get brittle. They right. last. And one of the reasons they work so well, and I was going to wait to touch on this, but I'll go ahead. These holes on the bottom right here provide good drainage. They also have a, what do you call that shape there going down? Well, it's, it's kind of a reverse upside-down pyramid, but it's got these... See if we can show it there. Well, they call root training ribs in there. Mm -hmm. And it trains those roots, just like I showed you on, on this transplant earlier. It trains those roots to grow downward instead of wrapping around there. And that's gonna give you a lot better success when you go to put it in the ground. Yeah. One of the biggest problems the average person has growing seedlings is they overwater. Now, a lot of your diseases, such as your pithemia rhizon, crown rot, things like that, are waterborne diseases. So they happen when the the soil mix stays too wet. With well, these holes down at the bottom you get very good drainage. Now we set this on a type of a wire which is the same thing most people do. That way they can drain real good. And that is one of the keys growing a good transplant is having good drainage. You're going to have to water more often but you're going to cut down on that disease. Right and that I've seen a lot of people take those cheap trays and they do the bottom watering. Yep. But most of the, the people that are really growing plants out there that I know are doing top water. You're asking for trouble if you do that uh, system where you keep watering it all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. So in conjunction with that, we wanted to show you we've got a new kit we just put together. And we call it our seed starting kit. And this will give you everything you need to start all your plants for this fall. Okay, so the first thing is the bag. 
of pro mix that we talked about earlier. And this is enough to do two of those trays I just showed you. You may have a little bit left over. So you can start one tray now, plant those, start another tray a month or so later, and, and have over 300 plants. Yep. And then you get one of these trays, and how many? So 162 cells. 162 cells in that tray. Now you don't have to plant all of them at one time. Or you could plant two or three different varieties in one tray. I've done that several right. times. What else do we get? In well, our how about this nice, handy dram water? So when you when you're watering these plants, these seedlings, you don't want to use just any run-of-the-mill water in one. And the reason of that is, is you got to have something that's going to break that water up into tiny droplets, so it's not going to beat down your plants. Yep. And these dram wands have this little soft touch nozzle on there, breaks it up really nice and gives you just kind of a light watering uh, so you're not beating it down, you're not running soil away from, you know, washing everything off. And uh, we've been using these for years and really like Yeah, this is their new one touch little deal right there, which I kind of like. All right, the next thing you get is four packs of seed. Now these are cold crops. These are cool weather crops. That's right. Collards. We've got um, southern variety collards called champion collards. We've got the Lacinato kale or the Toscano kale. Which, which I, I really like, yeah. And uh, that will grow, you know, on in throughout the winter. It's, it's That's no Italian heirloom. Right. We've got a variety of broccoli called Waltham 29, which is a nice standard variety of broccoli. Mm -hmm. um, and then... It's a kale, not a kale, but a... Well, we can tear into it, I guess, can't we? Oh, we got uh, lettuce in there. Lettuce, yep. Some romaine lettuce, uh, Paris Island, which mm -hmm. is a variety that we grow as well. So four, there's enough seed in here to, to do that tray twice. Um, so over 300 plants worth, you figure that up, you pay $3, $4 a plant at the box store. Uh, you're looking at $1,200 worth of plants you can grow in no time with this easy kit right Yep. Here. And then you get some markers to mark your varieties. What I do is if I'm planting more than one variety in that flat, on the end I will mark my varieties. And a lot of times I may not want 162 of lettuce, so I may want whatever. I can split it up in thirds and plant a third of each or, or however I want to do it. And these are really handy for that. Yeah, and what we like to do is we'll write the the variety on one side and the crop on the other side. Yep. And uh, gives you a good idea. Now let's give them a little quick tutorial here on, uh, hand me that seed tray there, on kind of how we do this. So imagine we're sitting in the greenhouse here. We've got our tray. Well, first thing I'll do is I'll just dump some soil some of that pro mix in here and you take your hand and smooth it around till you get it all the cells evenly filled there mm -hmm. you don't want them overflowing you want the dirt just kind of right below the the level there then you want to water that in mm -hmm. you want to kind of go ahead and soak that soil a little bit and it's going to take two or three waters so sometimes the soil can repel water a little bit so it's going to take two or three waters to get that that cell completely wet okay so once you do that then you want to make some indentions or dibbles for your seeds to go in. And keep in mind with this, a good general rule of thumb is you want to plant the seed twice as deep as the diameter of the seed. Yeah. So the easiest thing to do here, what we do is we just take our fingers here and go along and just make some tiny indentions. And for these cold crop seeds that are small, it doesn't have to be that big at all. So just some tiny indentions, every one of those holes, and then we'll come drop our seed in those holes. Now you can put, you can be real careful and put one seed per hole. Sometimes I put more than one just to make sure I get a full And sometimes flat. it's hard to control how many you put in there, but it's no big deal. You can thin them out after they come up. I'd rather go a little heavy than I had not. I try to get one seed in there, but if two or three seed falls in there, I don't sweat it. I go on and I can thin those out later on. Yeah, and, and then the last step, which is probably one of the most important, is to put a light dusting to cover those seeds. Now, you can easily put too much dirt on top of them, which is going to affect your germination. So you just want to lightly cover these things. Yeah, I'll take a little cup and just kind of shake it over the tops the way I do it. Yeah. Then you wet them in. Here comes the, the good part. You keep these babies wet. 
for the germination time till they start sprouting and coming up you you want to go out there at least a couple three times a day and keep them wet you don't want it to dry out and for your brassicas like those right there uh in the kind of weather we've been having usually four days or so you're going to start seeing them emerge from yeah. the soil so that seed has got enough energy inside of it to pop up and get if it needs nothing else besides some soil and some moisture to get to to germinate and to come up well now when it comes up it's got two leaves on there mm -hmm. and then after that it starts getting what we call true leaves the second set of leaves are the true leaves that's right and because it we're using a sterile potting mix, mm -hmm. okay? Now, th this one has a little bit of slow-release organic fertilizer in there, but, but it's, it's not a, a significant amount. Um, once those plants get up, they're gonna need some nutrients because that sterile mix, that potting mix is sterile, doesn't have any weed seed in it or anything like that. But we're gonna need to supply some nutrients to those plants while, in the time that we're waiting to put them in the ground. Yep. Yep. And I like to hit mine, once those two leaves come up on that plant, I like to hit mine at that point because you're anticipating those true leaves coming on. So that's the point when I like to start fertilizing is when we see those those first leaves pop out of the ground. Yeah, and if we uh, if you saw our uh, two minute tip yesterday, this right here is what we use, this brass siphon mixer here. Really simple, really easy piece. And um, as always, our old good go-to blue 2020 works perfect for fertilizing the seeds. So let's talk about the kit just a little bit more before we wrap up on this. So with the kit, you get the tray, you get the dram wand, you get the plant marker, you get the bag of Pro Mix, and you get what else? We got there. That's it, ain't it? So you get this. You get one, two, three, four, five things. Everything but the water spigot. Everything but the water. Everything you need to get started for how much? $69.99. Yep. And that's for free shipping, isn't it? That's for free shipping. Yep. Like I said, you can grow over 300 plants with that this yep. fall. So if we do 70 down by 300, what do you come up with there per plant? Pretty, pretty, a lot cheaper than at the big box store. Yeah, so seven will go into, seven will go into three, what, one, two, three, say two. So you're talking, yeah, it's pretty cheap. Yeah, and if, if, if you don't need 300 plants, split one with your neighbor. Yep, or save them for later. That's right, yeah, those seeds will be good next yep. year. All right. Now, we did have a, before we get into our questions, and as always, if you have any questions during the show, put those, um, in the description and we'll be glad to answer them next week. On our two minute tip where we were talking about fertilizing these plants, I had a, a question on there. Somebody was asking about using organic fertilizer in these for these seedlings. Oh, we're in for a biology lesson here, ain't we? And so there's a reason why we don't use organic fertilizers in these seedlings, okay? So these seedlings are in a sterile potty mix and you want something fast, okay? So let's- We're manipulating the environment to do the, what we do. Right, and you want something that as soon as you put it there, it's ready to be absorbed by the plant. You don't want to have to have any other breakdown steps happening. You want fast action. So, let's talk about why organic fertilizer would not be good for seedlings or transplants. So this is our, this is a cell membrane for plants or animal cells, and it consists of what we call a phospholipid bilayer. Okay? Mm. So we've got our phosphate head and these little lipid tails here. And this thing is what we call semi-permeable. So that means some stuff can pass through it, or, or meaning the plant can absorb some things, but other things it can't. Okay? And this is a very simplified version. There's a lot of other complex things going on here. But this is our cell membrane. This is what's gonna be absorbing that fertilizer or those nutrients that we're supplying to the plant. Now, when we talk about something that's organic, at its true meaning, that means that it contains carbon, mm -hmm. okay? And so, when we use organic fertilizers, compost, blood meal, fish emulsion. Soft rock phosphates. All of that stuff, the, we don't need the carbon really, we need that nitrogen, but it's tied to these huge carbon molecules. And so, just to give you an example, it might look something like this, or even larger than this. These really big 
carbon molecules and those are too big to pass through that membrane I showed you earlier. So for that nitrogen there, which is that's the only piece of that we really want, mm -hmm. for that nitrogen to be accessible to the plant, we've got to break all this down. It has to be broken down by, by the microbes in the soil. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind we're dealing with a sterile mix here. Right. So if we put this in there, we've got to wait on the soil, the sterile soil, which doesn't have any microbes in it, to try to break this down to pull off that nitrogen and then it'd be accessible to the plants, which is gonna take way longer. Not impossible, but it's gonna take way longer than what we got time for. Right. So plants need to absorb nitrogen in primarily two forms, ammonia, which is NH4, or our nitrate here, which is NO3. So if we give it to them in this inorganic form right here, no carbon attached to it, they can absorb it just like that. Right. And we can get some quick action. Yep. So there is a place for organic fertilizers. Oh yeah, and if you're doing this in a soil situation, it's completely different because you got a lot of microbes. You're not dealing with a sterile mix if you're planting directly into the soil. What we're talking about is just for planting into a sterile mix in a greenhouse setting where you're trying to grow some plugs and you're trying to do it quick. So if you, you throw some organic fertilizer to it, you're probably not going to see any fast results. Whereas this, when we shoot that 20, 20, 20 to it, we can, we yeah, can see Yes, what we used to call the chain. So the chain that breaks down and actually makes it available to the plant is a lot longer with that organic than it is with the inorganic. Right, Boom. right, right. And in the, in the soil, we have time to wait. In the greenhouse and the seed start situation, we don't really have time. And that's the reason we're proponents of the 20, 20, 20, especially in cooler weather, these fish emulsions, worm castings, and other things like that, in cool, especially in cool soils and cool conditions, that chain is a lot longer. It's nearly impossible to get them to convert in any timely way to that available nitrogen form. Because you got to have, have heat to catalyze those reactions to right. start breaking it down. Yeah, the 2020 is idiot proof. Boom, it's there. Boom. Boom. Set it and forget it. All right. So there's your biology lesson for the day. There we go. All right. Now let's get into our questions this week. And as always, if you have any questions, put them in the comments. And this week, for any questions we answer that we receive this week and answer next week, we're going to send two lucky people a copy of this right here, which is a very fitting book for what we've been talking about mm -hmm. here, the Greenhouse Gardener's Manual. So... Oh, Roger Marshall wrote that book. He did. Roger's a good guy. Knows yep. a lot about growing in the greenhouse. Yep. And uh, so put your questions in the comments, and we might answer, we might send you one of these. No, we we we, we, we will. If we answer your if question. If we answer your question, yeah. we will. And if we if we answer your question this week, send us an email to cussserveathosttools.com. Yep. And we'll uh, we'll get that koozie out to you from last week. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get our question. Our first one is from Tim Jones. And uh, Tim's actually in Cairo, right up the road. Yep. Cairo. Cairo. I tell folks, I said, don't call it Cairo. They're running out of town. <laughs> and uh, Tim wants to know, what's the good crop, good cover crop to plant after the spring garden? He's wanting to add nutrients to the soil and then, you know, smother out the weeds. <coughs> he wants to know if he planted that cover crop in spring, would it be sufficient? To, to next spring or he need to till that in and plant another cover crop in the fall? Well, cover crops, we need to get them in there fast and get them out fast. The one thing about cover crops is we want to plant them. They grow real quick. We want to put that biomass back in the soil. We, want, we like quick growing summer, uh, cover crops in the spring because it outpaces some of those invasive weeds such as pigweed. My favorites, the ones used down in the south, is the sorghum sudan grass mm -hmm. and the buckwheat. Right. Uh, I actually, like I said earlier, I've, I've got to the point I like to grow some sunflowers, but the reason I like to grow those other two is because I can outpace that pigweed and these other faster. weeds that can grow faster than them and shade them out. So it suppresses those weeds. Here's the thing about the buckwheat, especially the buckwheat, it can be invasive. You always want to cut and put these back into the soil when they start to see, when they, in that blooming process, you want to cut them down, put them back. You do not want these babies to seed out. So, so what you're saying is you're going to need to plant 
of warm weather cover crop mm -hmm. after spring. If you're not going to grow, if you're going to grow a spring garden and not plant any other vegetables there until next spring, you're going to do your warm weather cover crop, your buckwheat, your sorghum sudan, millet, millet, uh, sun hemp. Yep. And then before those go to seed, you're going to cut those till them in. Put you another one in there. If you don't have anything to plant there at that time, go ahead and put you another cover crop in there. Just continue to grow them cover crops till you get ready to put a crop in there that and you then come down here in this area come october or so when you want to plant your cool weather cover crops your clover crimson clover something like that fetch a several different ones so so yeah you wouldn't want to plant one in spring and ex expect it nope. to to run the whole year you're gonna have to rule of thumb except with the clovers and the vetch because i do like some of my clovers and vetches to reseed rule of thumb with any of these summer cover crops is always cut them in at what they call bolt or bloom stage go ahead and get those babies cut in get that biomass put back into the soil and go to your next crop whether it be another cover crop or uh, a crop you want to plant to eat all right thank you for that question tim send us your uh, address and we'll get that koozie out to you and then our last question this week is from Gary, and uh, he asked us a question on Facebook. I want to know what we consider the most invasive type of weed in the South. And I, I'm going to modify this question a little bit and, and say what weed is, is I, the one we struggle with the most currently. And everybody's going to have a different answer to this because different weeds grow in different type of soils in different ways. So some people could have trouble with goosegrass, as somebody mentioned in there. And we, it's, goosegrass is not a big one for us. Crabgrass. Crabgrass, pigweed, and nutgrass is our three, and not necessarily in that order. But that's our three top ones. But uh, your soil conditions, where your garden is in lowland or highland or in your zone, that question could have a different answer. And for me personally, so the nutgrass, we've talked about this before, I can aggravate it to death enough well, I, I don't really have a big nutgrass problem anymore. Pigweed is aggravating a little bit, and and the crabgrass is aggravating because it sprawls along the ground and reroots. But if I'm diligent with my wheel hoe and I'm in there like I should be, them cultivator teeth or them sweeps that oscillating hoe, when it flips, flip, flips that weed over in, in this warm weather, it'll dry out in a day. It's done. I'm done with it. The one I've been having problems with is this one here called purslin. Mm -hmm. Now that is the prostrate purslin. There's another one that grows upright. Right, so this one crawls along the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the problem I have with this one, is, and see I pulled this one this morning and it looks still fresh as a daisy. This is a succulent, which means it needs absolutely zero water. So if I go through there with a wheel of weed in my garden, I flip this thing over, it's not going to dry out and die like those other weeds were. I'm going to have to go in there and by hand grab it and throw it out of the garden. So this one, although it's easy to pull up, it's been the most difficult one for me because it's aggravating and it don't dry out like the other mm -hmm. ones do. Yeah, I don't have that. I, I have had that problem in the past. I don't have a problem with that weed right now. Um, so that's the one I'm struggling with. Put your most aggravating weed in the comments. It'd be good to see regionally across the country mm -hmm. what everybody's dealing with. Yep. All right. So that's going to do it for today's show. Glad you joined us and we hope you join us next week. Yep. See you then.